On May 20th, 2013, the town of Moore, Oklahoma was hit by a catastrophic EF5 tornado, making it the second time in 14 years that such an event occurred in the Oklahoma City suburb. Much of Moore was leveled by the extremely violent tornado, with 24 people killed and 212 people injured. This tornado would begin the start of a phenomenon that had never happened in recorded history the longest EF5 drought. There were several close calls, however. One just 11 days later in El Reno, just 38 miles away from Moore. This tornado became the largest tornado in recorded history, with the massive wedge tornado stretching 2.6 miles across at its apex. Originally, it was rated as an EF5, but was subsequently downgraded to an EF3 tornado mainly due to it affecting rural areas despite a max wind speed of 295 miles per hour. There was also Mayfield, Kentucky on December 10th, 2021, with EF5 winds recorded by Doppler radar, but because it affected rural areas at the time of its peak, it was registered as a high-end EF4. Another infamous example was Rolling Fork, Mississippi on March 24th, 2023. This tornado had decimated much of Rolling Fork and Silver City, with cars even getting lifted into the vortex and thrown. But because of poor infrastructure and lower building quality, it was rated as a 195 mile per hour EF4. For years, it was so close yet so far for getting the next EF5 as the drought continued. Even on a hot, muggy day in late June 2025, the drought continued to persist. However, as day turned to night across North Dakota, a cluster of supercells began to fire across the eastern part of the state. One cell would become notorious for making history. And while the tornado it produced only stayed on the ground for 19 minutes, those 19 minutes would not only destroy a community, but would break the drought and bring the return of the EF5 monster. This is the story of the Enderland tornado, from how it formed, to how it leveled a community, to how it brought back the EF5. The first mention of the setup that would bring the Enderlin tornado was on June 15, 2025, with the SPC mentioning the presence of a mid-level ridge expected to enter the upper Midwest and Great Lakes region on the 20th. This ridge was expected to carry a significant amount of moisture and convectively unstable air to the region, but because of the uncertainties of the ridge placement, predictability was too low to put a 15% risk. An upper level trough was forecasted to move into the upper Midwest and allow for ample shear to impact the region, bringing a dangerous combination across the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Saskatchewan in Canada. When you have plenty of warm, moist air from a ridge with cool, dry air from an incoming trough, coupled with a significant amount of wind shear, which is a change in wind speed and direction with height, you get all the ingredients needed for significant severe weather and tornadoes. Such a mixture became more apparent on June 18th, when the SPC issued a slight risk of severe weather from western North Dakota all the way to the upper peninsula of Michigan, with a 15% hatch risk for all severe weather. A hatched risk is indicative of significantly severe weather, which is classified as straight line winds greater than 75 miles per hour, hail of 2 inches or greater, and EF2 or stronger tornadoes, and in this case, it stretched out through most of the risk area. Confidence began to increase in the general area of severe weather, but there was still some uncertainty about timing and where the worst of it would hit. On June 19th, an enhanced risk of severe weather was issued, mainly concentrated in North Dakota and western Minnesota. Severe thunderstorms were becoming increasingly likely across the northern Great Plains, but the main threat was not for tornadoes. That only had a 5% risk attached to it. 
Instead, it was mainly wind and hail that were the main drivers of the enhanced risk, with a 30% hatched risk issued for both, meaning that there were a 30% chance of 75 mile per hour winds and 2 inch hail or larger happening within 25 miles of a point. While there was a large amount of instability expected across the region, with three to 4,000 joules per kilogram of convectedly available potential energy expected, the timing was still a major factor regarding the tornado risk. According to the SPC, quote, should storms form in this area around or after 0Z, which is 7 p.m. local time, very large hail and tornadoes appear likely as low-level shear will be maximized here, closed quote. If cells fired too early, the tornado risk would be limited due to this likely turning into a squall line of thunderstorms. If they fired too late, there would not be enough energy to support supercell development. So you kind of have this Goldilocks type scenario in place here. However, the next day, several factors would start to get into place that would lead to a much higher tornado risk. At 1 a.m. on June 20th, the SPC extended the enhanced risk area much further east all the way to the northwest tip of Wisconsin, with a 10% hatched risk of tornadoes now designated. That meant that there was a much higher likelihood of tornadoes, particularly at EF2 intensity or stronger, occurring within 25 miles of a point. Confidence on storm timing increased as there was much more cape than anticipated, along with 60 knot bulk shear with lapse rates nearing 8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Those are indicative of a more extreme, conditionally unstable atmosphere, but things would only get dicier once the morning soundings came in. The soundings out of both Bismarck, North Dakota and Aberdeen, South Dakota showed a large cap or area of stable air underneath the cape blocking any potential convection from tapping into that unstable air mass. In most circumstances, that would be a good sign, as with large amounts of capping in place, it would limit severe weather. However, with the large amount of shear in place, as well as the risk factor being nocturnal, meant that this was a scary recipe, and that if the cap held until early evening, there could be very explosive convection on the way. As the day of June 20th went on, more moist air from the southeast continued to move into the upper Great Plains with clearing skies, allowing temperatures to rise rapidly and allowing for more cape in the region. At this point, the SPC was highlighting the increased likelihood of extreme severe weather starting to develop in the evening, with the threat of tornadoes and very large hail becoming more pronounced. But things would only go from bad to worse. At 8 p.m., the SPC issued a moderate risk of severe weather, mainly for the wind risk, although supercell development was expected in the next couple of hours. The supercells were then expected to merge into a large squall line of thunderstorms, as a derecho was possible late into the night with winds of 80 plus miles per hour expected by the SPC. However, while the SPC was issuing that risk, events in east central North Dakota were kicking off that would make history. In the hour before the moderate risk was issued, a large thunderstorm began to develop near Jamestown, North Dakota, and by 8.15 p.m., these storms were strong enough to catch the attention of both the SPC and the NWS. At 8.15 p.m., the SPC issued a mesoscale discussion detailing the developing supercell entering an extremely unstable environment. With Cape over 4,500 joules per kilogram and extreme wind shear, this supercell was entering the best conditions of the night with only a matter of time before something blew up. This supercell, as it moved into better conditions, began to produce several tornadoes, including an EF-3 that touched down at 8.51 p.m. and caused significant damage near Spiritwood, North Dakota, before dissipating at 9.20 p.m. It also spawned two EF-2s, one that touched down at 9.29 p.m. and caused damage near Valley City before dissipating at 9.50 p.m., the other touched down at 10.20 p.m. near Fort Ransom before dissipating at 10.29 p.m. The next big tornado that would drop would go on to make history, and as the clock turned past 11 o'clock p.m., everything was about to come to a head. The tornado would touch down at 11.02 p.m. on 58th Street Southeast, which is less than 4 miles south of Enderlin. The tornado was initially weak, affecting rural areas and breaking tree branches at EF0 strength, but it quickly strengthened to EF2 intensity as it moved along County Road 55. It then struck the ADM Edible Bean Specialties Grain Elevator facility, destroying the outbuilding and snapping large trees. 
It then rapidly intensified as it approached the Elbow Lake subdivision, which is a railway that transports crude oil and agricultural goods. The tornado lofted five railway cars from a stopped freight train and derailed 28 others. This will be critical later. The tornado continued to grow in size, reaching just over a mile in width, becoming a large and extremely dangerous wedge tornado as it leveled forests, shook homes off their foundations, and scoured crops across its path. Afterward, the tornado then crossed North Dakota State Route 46 and decimated two homes. The first was completely leveled with debris scattered hundreds of yards away, but because of the poor anchoring of the home, the damage was estimated at mid-range EF4 intensity, although it is speculated that it was much stronger at this location. The second home was located roughly 300 yards to the west, and that along with several outbuildings were leveled at EF4 intensity. At this point, the tornado began to weaken, causing EF2 damage to trees and crops before briefly restrengthening to EF3 intensity as it leveled a farmhouse and caused damage to four steel transmission towers. After this, the tornado began to rapidly narrow and weaken, snapping additional trees before dissipating at 11.21 p.m., lasting for 19 minutes. As this was occurring, a massive line of thunderstorms was developing across North Dakota throughout the evening eventually becoming a derecho that would begin to absorb this that had developed ahead of the line. This derecho would produce straight-line winds of over 100 miles per hour as it crossed North Dakota throughout the evening. The derecho continued to strengthen as it moved through eastern North Dakota and entered Minnesota around midnight on June 21st. In the town of Bemidji, Minnesota, the derecho blew out windows in several buildings, including a hospital, and turned cars over, recording a wind gust of 106 miles per hour as the storm moved through. After this, the derecho began to slowly weaken as it moved through northern Minnesota, with some of the derecho crossing over Lake Superior at 3 a.m., while the rest moved into northwestern Wisconsin. The derecho would fall below severe thunderstorm levels at 5 a.m. while moving over the upper peninsula of Michigan, with the complex slowly dissipating throughout the day on June 21st. While the tornadoes and derecho were very destructive in the upper Midwest, because they affected mainly rural areas, this would have likely been seen as a footnote to the larger meteorological community. However, as the damage surveyors began to investigate the damage of the Enderlin tornado, they quickly realized that this was more than a destructive night of severe weather. The initial rating of the Enderlin tornado was a high-end EF3, but because that is the highest a local NWS office can designate a tornado, they had to call in damage specialists and engineers to look at the extreme damage the tornado left behind. The main area that was looked to assess the tornado damage were the 33 train cars that were derailed on the Elbow Lake subdivision. Of the 33 cars derailed, 19 of them were fully loaded hopper cars with grain, which weighed approximately 286,000 pounds each. All these cars were tipped off the tracks, with one car getting thrown to the adjacent field by the railway, landing approximately 100 feet away. The other 14 were empty cars weighing approximately 72,000 pounds, and four of these cars were thrown onto the field. One of the cars was thrown considerably further than the others, landing approximately 800 feet away from the railway and 475.7 feet away from the previous car it was attached to. With the assistance of several wind damage experts and the collaboration of the University of Western Ontario's Northern Tornadoes Project, it was estimated that the winds had to be at least 230 miles per hour for the train cars that were fully loaded with the grain to be tipped over, let alone get thrown on the adjacent field. On top of that, winds of at least 266 miles per hour were needed to lift an empty train car 475.7 feet away from the car it was attached to. Radar data also painted a very clear picture of the strength of the tornado at that time, with extreme radar measurements measured as they were literally maxed out on the Doppler radar at a total velocity of 280 miles per hour. Because of these findings, on October 6, 2025, the NWS upgraded the Enderlin tornado to an EF5 rating, becoming the first EF5 tornado recorded in 12 years. From May 20th, 2013 until June 20th, 2025, there were no EF5s recorded across the United States, although there were several tornadoes that came extremely close. The drought was over, not from a destructive tornado wiping out a major town, but ironically from a tornado that derailed a few dozen railway cars in rural North Dakota. 
In total, three people were killed by the tornado, with millions of dollars damage caused to the train cars and buildings it impacted. The entire outbreak and resulting derecho would result in seven deaths, four injuries, and up to $875 million in damage as North Dakota and Minnesota would begin to recover from this historic outbreak. There were so many times that an EF5 tornado could have been designated between May 20th, 2013 and June 20th, 2025. El Reno was briefly rated as an EF5 before subsequent surveys downgraded it to an EF3. The 2015 Rochelle tornado in Illinois had several well-built homes swept away with a high-end EF4 designated at 200 miles per hour. But the closest of them all was arguably the Rolling Fork tornado in 2023. The tornado did not get the EF5 rating based off a technicality due to the buildings not being very well built. However, it took an extremely violent tornado and new methods of rating tornado damage on a railway in North Dakota to bring back the ultra-rare rating. The Enderland tornado had many firsts other than its rating. It was the first tornado to determine an accurate rating based on damage to train cars instead of homes, buildings, and vehicles. It was also the first time that the weight of vehicles and equipment were considered in the rating, which will be critical down the line. It also undoubtedly will set a new standard going forward to better assess tornado damage, whether the rating is underestimated or overestimated, but one thing is for certain, and that is the Enderlin tornado will always be remembered as the tornado that brought back the EF5 rating, and the one that ended a historic streak of near misses. <laughs>